Welcome, Lynn. Thank you so much for being on the podcast today. Thanks, Lara, for having me. I love any chance I get to talk. <laughs> I know, right? Physical therapist, uh, I think you have to already like talking if you're going to be a physical yeah. therapist. It's not like a lab researcher where you, you can really just kind of close off. Um, because uh, I think at our heart, we're, educate, you know, we're educating people. And so, yeah, let's talk about your background as a physical therapist. You said you were a physical therapist for 30 years. How did you decide yeah. to go into physical therapy? Um, you know, I was an athlete in high school and, and college. And I, um, you know, I always had an interest in movement in the body and I always thought I was going to be a sports PT though, you know, in the Me too. Forum, Me too. Mm -hmm. Right. Went into it with that. And, um, and then I, you know, early on, I kind of got a little, uh, what's the right word? I, I, I wasn't getting people better well, you know, so I got a little disenchanted, whatever the word is I'm looking for there. But um, I just, I wasn't, I, I wasn't feeling like I was effective. Right. And so I, um, I moved to, from St. Louis to Seattle and I started doing temp work and I really liked that because it gave me a little chance to check everything out. And I think I've pretty much done almost every aspect of PT other than pediatrics. And, um, and so I like that because I, I really did bring the orthopedics um, to home health and to the nursing home and to the hospital, you know? So, um, but then I, what happened? I was working in a nursing home and then um, a big change happened in the nursing home. And I went to work for therapy uh, associates in Seattle and I started their women's health program. So I got into women's health and um, boy, once I started doing that, I knew I was home like this. <laughs> is what I'm supposed to be doing. And um, I, I always had an interest in the pelvis. Actually, after working with Jerry Cash and taking one of his courses on the pelvis, um, it revolutionized the way I worked with low back and sacroiliac joint pain. And I loved it. And so I was very um, focused on the pelvis already. And then I went and got one-on-one -on -one training with Kathy Wallace to learn the intravaginal piece of um, doing women's health. And then started taking courses. And I just, boy, once I started doing that, I just knew I was home. I was home. All right. Doing so let's right just, let, yeah, me. let's just pause and, for a second. Pelvis, like give us a couple things like that really changed your mind about like the importance of this era, you know, cause I, I'm the same way. And I, and I think many PTs are trained to look at the pelvis as like, this is the center of, you know, your mass. This is where it needs to be stable. It anchors the legs. But what was it about deep diving into that, that just, um, kind of revolutionized your thinking? Um, the foundation, just it mm -hmm. being the foundation of our body, right? Like it's the, it's the, the meeting point of the legs to the trunk and, um, and then the more I learned about it, the the sacredness of the organs that are housed within the pelvic space, right? Like totally. reading mm. Tammy Lynn Kent's work, The Wild Feminine, revolutionary. Like that piece of knowledge that she has poured into that book, that one book has like been dog-eared and highlighted and bookmarked and I mean, that is like my Bible and that, you know, that was just the next step of it. So like Jerry Hesch gave me that foundational structure of the pelvis and how important that was. And, and what he did was he brought spring testing to the pelvis. We, we spring test every other joint in the body, but we don't spring to, we do this little movement test to see and I never liked that little stork test. Like I just, I did it like, who can really tell if there's movement in there or not, right? And so he was uh, bringing that spring testing to the pelvis. That, And then he also brought awareness to the bones, to me, and the importance mm -hmm. of the bones in the body. And, and that bone actually is meant to have a little bit of give to it. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, I, I've never, I never had that concept before. Yeah, you know, and the shape bone. of the bones also really give you an idea of, a big a function that they play, you know, the pelvis being f those big flat bones, amazing, yeah. that curve around, like they're, they're so cool in the scapula. Yeah. Okay, so before we geek out on that, so <laughs> you were on your way, the introduction to the pelvis and then going deeper into understanding like 
Was it both female and male anatomy just in general or just female? Mm -hmm. Just female. Yeah. yeah. I just, I stayed with women and um, it wasn't until 2008 when I moved from Seattle to Boulder and I had to start all over again that I was building my practice up and I focused on um, pregnancy and postpartum. And in 2008, when I was, I was giving classes to new moms and helping them to understand all these changes that were happening to their body after having a baby, that I was just seeing postpartum women on my table. And that's when I discovered that everybody who laid down had all of these similar patterns. And I, it dawned on me that, you know, like most other physical therapists see women for vulvodynia or IC or back pain or incontinence or prolat, you know, and I was just focusing in on postpartum and that I was just working with the postpartum body. And that's what allowed me to discover all these patterns that I found in the postpartum body. And then I started figuring out how to release those patterns. And my clients were getting off the table in one session and no longer having pain or no longer leaking or, you know, and just having amazing results. Okay. And so let's talk a little bit about those patterns because yeah. it's interesting how you could have somebody say five, two, have, you know, be pregnant, maybe even with twins and somebody five, nine really carries small. But what you're saying is across the board, no matter what necessarily their size is or how big the baby is, there are some, there are certain patterns mm -hmm. that exist after pregnancy. Absolutely. Absolutely. So should we start with the pelvis since we've been talking Let's about go. that? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> okay. So in the pelvis, um, you know, Jerry Hush again, bringing his spring testing to the pelvis. And then also that idea of the bones having a, a softness to it. When I was palpating all these postpartum clients, first off, I saw my moms, they were rotating, their pelvises were rotating to the left. So I always start my sessions at the feet, looking up the body. And I would always see this rotation of the pelvis to the left. And then I got curious with it and did some spring testing and things that I knew, but it was when I added this sheer component to the sacrum that that rotation went away. And they're okay, back can you just back up for a second for yeah. the people who aren't PTs? There's many of those. Okay. Can you know. explain a little bit what you mean by spring testing of the pelvis? Yeah. So um, it's, it's taking a joint to its end range and then testing its ability. So we're testing the accessory motion in that Jerry Hush would call it micro movement. So the micro movement in the joint to make sure that that joint has that accessory play that it's supposed to have in there. And um, there's this pattern that I find that I was saying this rotation to the left that happens in a lot of people. It doesn't just happen in the postpartum clients. So I find this pattern in other patients, uh, other people that I see that haven't had babies, but I think in birth, it gets, ex it, it gets like pushed in more, you know, it mm -hmm. gets exaggerated more from what the way the baby comes out. And so instead of the sacrum being in midline, it's kind of, it's off to the right. And, and so when you say rotated, um, is the right side of the pelvis more forward? Yes. Is that? Yeah. Well, okay. But, uh, but so we're talking different planes here. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. There, there's a rotation more where, you know, those little hip bones that we have on the sides of our, our pelvis, right? We call them the ASIS and PT. Um, but those little bumps on either side, it's not about them rotating down towards the feet or up towards the head. It's not that kind of rotation. That's an anterior posterior rotation. What I'm talking about is a whole, like if you're laying on the table, that ASIS is going to be higher towards the ceiling. Yes. Okay. Okay. So it's that kind of rotation that I'm talking about. And um, I just figured out how to correct that in doing a, a couple of little steps. And, you know, these moms that were coming to me had seen chiropractors and massage therapists for months because of right-sided low back pain. And I would do those two maneuvers and then it would be out of that pain. And Can you so describe in some degree without giving away your magic, um, what, <laughs> what the maneuvers are? where you apply them and what they're yeah. doing. So it's, it's about taking, so I'm, I'm pressuring right on the inside of the PSIF. So those little bumps where our, our, you may have a dimple in your low back. 
So right on the inside of that. So what I find is that the sacral base, so that sacrum is that triangular bone at the base of your spine. And instead of that being nice and level, that is kind of tilted up on the right hand side. So that sacral base is higher on that right hand side and your sacral ir iliac joint in the pattern that is most common in the clients that I see, the right side has decreased mobility. Like it just doesn't move in there as freely as the left side does. And so I'm pressuring what I call the sacral sulcus. So that sacral base on that right side, pressuring it towards the ceiling and then pulling it down towards the feet. Got and it. So that helps to, to kind of bring, and then there's a shear that I really can't describe that one. The the shear pattern is, is it's more of a frontal plane motion that I do. And mm -hmm. it just helps to get the sacrum back into its midline position. And then we need to work with the, the ileal bones um, because what I, I always thought that when a baby came out, that the bow, that the baby comes up right in the midline. But as I was palpating all these postpartum pelvises, I was realizing that no, this, this side, the right side ischium got pushed up to the side more. And as I studied, I was studying the, the labor books of like, what's the pelvis supposed to do in order to get a baby out and start looking at those motions. And then I was like, oh my goodness, the bones don't go back together to their midline position after a baby comes out. Uh. And that was a huge, huge awareness for me. And I, I realized this because I was working on all these, you know, 30, late 20, 30 year old women that, you know, were coming into my practice just having had their first babies. And I realizing all these patterns. And then I worked on my aunt who had a 47 year old son at the time. And I'm like, your pelvis is doing everything that these postpartum moms are doing. And I realized that actually her bones never went back together after the birth of her first child, 47 years earlier. And then go to find out that her birth was really traumatic. Mm, and that, yeah. that pattern of openness, which I coined the open birthing pattern in the pelvis has remained. And mm. so what happens for a baby to come out is that your sit bones, the bones that we sit on, they splay out to the side and then your tailbone lifts backwards. And that increases the diameter of the pelvic outlet for the baby to come on out. And if there are, you know, sometimes the, the bones just don't come back together again, especially if there was any sort of trauma response in the body, that moment in time during birth where you're like, <gasps> I can't do this, or I don't want to do this. Or the doctor says, if you don't get this baby out, you're going to need a C-section. You know, any of those threats that happen during that birth, all of that could cause the body to go into what I call the freeze response, right? It's a trauma response and we can't fight birth. We can't flight from it. And so freeze is really the only other trauma response in the body that we can do during birth. And so the pelvis is kind of stuck in this <gasps> frozen response of getting that baby on out. And, you know, I, I sometimes find both ischium splayed out to the side, but a lot of times one side will be more splayed out than the other. And so if we know about our anatomy, all of the pelvic floor muscles attach to those bones. Yes. And so if the bones aren't back, you know, if they're not coming back to the normal position, now we have pelvic floor muscles that are on stretch. They are lengthened. Well, we know that there's studies that tell us as physical therapies, that the muscle is too short or too long, it's not as strong. Mm -hmm. And what I find is that there's a relative weakness because when you bring the bones back together to their midline position, the muscles instantaneously become stronger. Right there. Yeah. It's like that. It's like that perfect length tension ratio. And I wonder too, if there's something in our nervous system that when we're not in alignment and, 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 and in fact, in that op kind of open position, even though there's no reason for it to be open anymore, I wonder if that also like initiates some kind of guarding response because it doesn't feel safe. Right. You're like, right. right. Well, energetically, Laura, this pelvis, it, like it's our container, right? It's totally. our, yes. it, it contains all of our energy and like, uh, I, the, the pelvis is the engine of the body. Mm -hmm. And remember, I was telling you about my aunt with the 47 year old son who had a traumatic yeah. birth. She had zero containment of her energy. Her pelvis was wide open and her energy felt like a faucet with both the hot and cold turned on full blast. 
like just flowing on out and no containment. And she is a massive warrior, massive warrior, cannot sleep at night. Mm. And I just know that it, part of that is from that trauma response in the body and her losing energy. She can't contain her own energy. Mm, I totally believe that. I really do. I think that, you know, um, I often talk about energy is always there for us. We don't have, but we have, we have to know how to best contain it and generate and regenerate it. But yes. you're right. If you're always leaking it, I say leaking, losing it, whatever wow. it is, um, at some level that's that's got to cause anxiety or on the other end like just stagnancy and depression it really does impact our energy levels and because it at, at its very essence we don't have that feeling of this security and stability that is right. the essence and energetic um kind of marker of the pelvis i i started asking my clients where i was finding this open birthing pattern i'm like what are you feeling what are you noticing about yourself and the two main words that i heard from everybody was discombobulated and ungrounded. Mm. And Great. and I would have to say that 99.9% .9 of the people that I work with, I always assess how grounded their energy is flowing down their legs. And 99.9% .9 of them have zero energy flowing down their legs. And yeah. I'm working with postpartum clients. And so if, you know, I, there's something about that birth process that does cut off that energy flow going down. And I can't tell you the the difference that my clients feel when they get off the table and they're just like, boom, their feet are on the ground and they can feel and they've got this flow going down and they feel completely different oh, after I bet. Mm. getting things put back together again. You know, oh, like it's funny. One of my girlfriends who studied with me, she, she, um, she's taken my courses and she's like, well, you know, when a baby comes on out, uh, one client said, when a baby comes out, they rearrange the furniture inside the pelvis, which is our pelvic organs. And I totally agree with that. But then my other girlfriend says, and we know kids never put anything back together. We're in the first place where they, where they're supposed <laughs> to belong. And that's exactly what can happen to our pelvis. But you know, when a baby comes on out, there is no sense of normalcy in that pelvic space. You know, we don't remember what our pelvis was like prior to that baby coming out. So moms are left with this feeling like, you know, something feels different, but I don't really know what it is. And I feel off, but I've been, you know, and then they go to the diet, oh, you're fine. You just have a baby. What do you expect? Right. But what I am so completely passionate about is getting this idea out into the world that, hey, everybody, the bones of the pelvis don't always return to their original position after a baby comes out. And we as practitioners need to be looking at the pelvic bones. And there's research that tells us that, yes, the bones of the pelvis do move. And MRI studies that show different positions change the diameter and the the dynamics of the pelvic bones, but nobody has researched the dimension or the distance between the intertuberosity inter distances. So those ischial tuberosities do change dimensions when a baby comes out, but we haven't studied that yet. And that's what I, you know, until people will start to believe me, we need to get that study done so that those that are really stuck on the science and the research will start to realize what I'm feeling and finding in the clinic and have for the past 10 years. Right. Which is, you know, I think it's not just anecdotal. It's so powerful. But obviously, like you said, I'm the same way. Like, it seems like the newer eager beavers love to have the real like data behind yeah. it. But we also have to listen. This is where we listen. We're not influencing. We're like, we can hear when, when somebody says, I feel different. This is how it's translating. Right. Um, and Oh, there's so much to go on there. I mean, I think it's like when you talk about the ischial tuberosities too, um, like all that pelvic fascia, it attaches multiple ways across to the ischial tuberosity. So this I'm sure can, like anybody that's listening that is feeling hypertonic, well, hypertonic is a response that you don't feel as safe for something. Like it doesn't mean you're strong. Like I always, I love to really kind of make because you know in social media you get like a little glimpse of something 
And right. people are like, oh, I should never work on, you know, holding my, you know, working on pelvic muscles because I'm hypertonic. And it's like, well, that's not exactly it. It's really understanding, uh, again, this where are the bones so that maybe there isn't going to be a hypertonic response. How is your posture? How is your, yeah, go ahead. Right. Well, I always say that the the muscles of the body are doing something for a reason. Mm-hmm. And, and and the body and pain is there for a reason. And we as therapists working on bodies need to get curious and not just for something to happen. We need to understand what is happening because when you have someone who is dealing with hypertonic pelvic floor muscles and they may be dealing with pelvic pain and these hypertonic muscles are actually trying to keep the bones together in the first place. Okay. So then as we, as therapists go, oh, this is hypertonic, we should get it to release. So we jackhammer it to try to get that muscle to release. And we force a muscle to do something that it doesn't really want to do because it's counterintuitive to why it's doing it in the first place. The pelvic pain gets worse because now we just help them to be more unstable. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And that, By taking yeah. away that tension that's trying to hold them together. And if those bones are not in a stable position, the pelvic floor muscles are trying to create stability for someone. Mm. Okay. So this is why we have to get curious with the tissues and really understand why is it creating this tension? Why is it creating pain in the first place? And, um, and so bringing the bones back into their midline position helps the muscles can relax then. Right. Yes. So some of the things that, um, some of the clues for people listening in that maybe their pelvis is open or do I, how do I know? One is that you may feel like you're sitting different, like sitting just feels uneven or just feels different after having a baby. That means your sit bones might be one more splayed out to the other side or you're a little lopsided in there. You feel uneven, totally fine. Another key one is that laying on a hard surface hurts in the sacrum, the lower back So if that sacrum, the the tailbone needs to lift backwards for a baby to come on out, okay? And sometimes it gets stuck in that sacral flexion. So on my website, if you're a practitioner, I have a free sacral flexion course. You can check out and see um, how to correct that. Um, It's free because I just want this information to get out there. I want therapists to start looking for this stuff. And there's three different signs that you can look for to know that someone is stuck in a sacral flexion pattern. But one of the key pieces is that these people hate laying on a hard surface because it hurts. There's there's too much pressure on the sacrum because the sacrum is in, in their normal position. Mm, so got it. those are some really key, key points. Um, for a therapist, um, for those of you that understand the anatomy, bilateral coccygeous tension is a sign that the sacrum is probably in flexion. If wow. their inferior uh, sphincter muscle has tension in it, it's being pulled back by that tailbone, being in it's not its proper place. So, so in addition are... to pain, what might somebody also internally feel with that positioning? Um, they're, uh, with the sphincter being involved, maybe incomplete emptying or not being able to, you know, um, the, the sphincter can't fully close because the back half of it is being held open. Um, so so incomplete emptying or having to wipe a lot or you know there there's involvement of the sphinc- sphincter, so the anal sphincter muscle. Um, so in general, from the open birthing pattern, some of the symptoms that that you can have problems with is pain with intercourse. So insertional pain with intercourse, if those muscles are already tight ropes, Instead of being a circular opening, your vaginal space is now an oval going mm-hmm. its longer side to side. So right, because the ischial tuberosities are spread have, out. Yeah, yeah. I've pulled them. Now they're a tightrope, right? Mm. So what used to be a circle is now an oblong, you know, oval shape. And so as therapists, if you're doing an internal exam and, you know, it's no longer a circle and it's tight side to side from three o'clock to nine o'clock, then you need to think maybe those sit bones are too far apart. And we need to bring them back into the midline. So insertional pain with intercourse, pelvic floor weakness, the inability of the pelvic floor muscles to be able to relax or to activate. Um, and then uh, potential for prolapse. When those those pelvis is in this open pattern, there's not that stability for the support of the pelvic organs. Um, and then uh, pelvic pain, back pain. Those can all be issues that moms complain of after birth. And then the, the most 
Um, because a lot of times this this instability, this the pelvis being an open birthing pattern doesn't create much pain until you get pregnant again. And, and now you have pelvic pain and back pain because you're pregnant. So pregnancy creates more laxity in the pelvic structure. And so when someone comes to me in pregnancy and it's a subsequent pregnancy and they're dealing with pelvic pain, the number one question I ask them is, did you have this in your previous pregnancy? And if the answer is no, they never had any pelvic pain or back pain in a previous pregnancy and now they're pregnant and now they're having all sorts of thing. Guess what? Their pelvis is in an open birthing pattern. Wow. And when you close those bones back up, when you bring those bones back to their original position, their pelvic pain goes away in one session when you wow. know what to look for and you know what to do. And so I'm so passionate about getting this information out there, Laura, because it's so damn effective. Of course. And every, like, I mean, I have so many clients or teachers that'll say, you know, they had a baby. Do you think I should, I'm, I'm feeling great. Do you think I should see a pelvic um, PT? I'm like, absolutely. I mean, yes. if you're going to go back and see your OBGYN who may or may not give you much information, like, except that you're clear for all activity, yeah. you know, you're going to need a little bit more than that. And you want to see like, yeah, what happened and how does it feel? Because sometimes we don't, you know, especially in those early stages, you're so tired, you're so exhausted. It's yes. really hard for your brain to discern like what is actually, what am I sensing here or how, yeah. or am I just living in this state of like chronic stress and fatigue? It's really yeah. important to go see someone. So I'm so happy you're passionate about it. And I yeah. feel like it's um, something that insurance should cover, that it should be mandatory sure. and that it should, you know, I'm sure many other nations in the world are already doing this much better. Yeah. I just want to get the word out about looking for this open birthing pattern because it really does help moms feel so much better. Now I've got a question. I'm sure that yeah. you've got, you, you know, this has been um, asked a lot because not everybody does have a vaginal birth. So if One. somebody has a C-section, is it similar even though they didn't have a baby go all the way down the birth canal, they might've been going a little bit and that's, you know, it might've been scheduled ahead of time. Who knows? But like how, like some are, what are the misconceptions of that? Because sometimes we're like, right. well, I had a C-section. That's kind of a bummer. But the good news is I didn't have to have the same. Yeah. And I don't know if that's always true. <laughs> so we, we, you need to understand what happened in the birth. That's like, as, as therapists, we need to be asking questions because if someone comes to me and they've had a cesarean birth, I want to know, did you labor at all? Mm. Did you, you know, was it a, a labored cesarean? And then the question is, well, how much did that maybe get into the pelvis? Did, did the baby, you know, did they have a hard time getting baby out when they did the cesarean because the head was kind of wedged into the pelvis? Um, and so in that regard, so the pelvis goes, the pelvis opens up the pelvic inlet to get the baby in, and then it opens up the pelvic outlet to get the baby out. So with a cesarean, with a labored cesarean, then I'm thinking, well, maybe the pelvis might be stuck more in that, that inlet opening. Okay. And so mm -hmm. we just want to assess, like we need to be assessing these pelvic bones, um, to, to see like, what was the impact of that birth on those pelvic bones? Right. Yeah. So if there was no labored cesarean, it was just a straight cesarean, then we really need to help our clients, uh, the moms that have had the cesarean birth to understand the impact of scar tissue. Yes. And that cesarean births create a ton of lower abdominal scar tissue. Now, some people don't scar as well as others. Um, they're the lucky ones. Those that are good scarers there's three main issues that you could be dealing with and that you they don't always show up right away. Sometimes these three issues don't come into the body till 10 to 15 years later and nobody's thinking cesarean. You know, no one's thinking about the scar tissue then. So one is, is bladder frequency. The uterus sits right behind the bladder and so scar tissue forms very haphazardly to, to heal the area. And it can inhibit the bladder from being able to stretch fully. And then you're feeling like you have to pee every 20 minutes. And it's really just scar tissue inhibiting the bladder from being able to expand. So you need to get in there and release that scar tissue so the bladder can expand. The other thing is deep thrusting pain. 
We talked about insertional pain being a problem with the pelvic floor muscles, but deep thrusting pain is a problem that the uterus can't, the cervix can't move freely. It's like hitting a brick wall. Mm. And that brick wall is the scar tissue from the uterus on the bladder, not allowing those tissues to move freely. So when we have that thrusting, all that tissue needs to be able to move freely up and down without having any restriction. And that scar tissue creates restriction. So that can create deep thrusting pain. And then low back pain. The, the uterus has uterosacral ligaments that attach from the back of the uterus to either the sacrum or the coccygeus muscle, sacral tuberous ligaments in there. And I've never met a C-section scar that's not tighter on one side than the other. And it's usually the side the surgeon stood on. And that side will have more scar tissue, which will pull that uterus in forward, which creates this torquing, which pulls on the attachments wherever those uterosacral ligaments are attaching in the back. And then that prevents the sacrum from being able to move freely. And it creates back pain. I have, a, I have two boys. They're 23 and 21 now. But this was back when my boys were 8 and 10, somewhere there. My, I had a girlfriend who had the same age boys. And the, our boys were hanging out together. And she was getting ready to go camping and her back went out on her. And she came to see me. And all I did was work on her C-section scar. And she she had had two C-sections. And she got off the table and she felt so much better. She was able to go camping the next day. Wow. And so then I saw her two years later, the same thing happened. She was getting ready to go camping and her back went out. I think she has an issue with camping, but she <laughs> she's trying to get out of it. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. But this time, earlier in the year, she had had ACL surgery. So she had been hobbling around on a bad knee for six months. And so when she came to see me, I didn't listen to her body well enough. I started just adjusting her pelvis and her knee and her back and all this stuff. And, you know, and because I thought that's what was creating the back pain. But I saw her the next day at a school picnic. And she's like, no, I still got the pain. I went, I never worked on your C-section scar. I laid her on the picnic table, released the C-section scar, and she got up with no pain. Amazing. Amazing. And And I think some people are going to be like, but how do you release this scar? Because we've all seen scars and how they just are. It feels like they're just sealed to the layer beneath it. I mean, I know you can't describe it. I I do scar releases as well. I've done it on myself. Um, And it is, yeah, like it's still... Tissue, whether it's bone or collagen in the form of scar tissue, still can be moved. Yeah. 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 I used to think that maybe we're making it go away, but then I actually saw a surgery with scar tissue and I'm like, oh, we're not. Yeah, no. It's. But I I think what we're doing is just giving- Freeing up some of it. Yeah. Yeah, yep. exactly. Yep. The, the right. adhesions, at least, it's like it's like loosening the seams, but you're never going to pull the seam apart. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Right. Good if analogy can, there. And I think I even have... if you, yeah, even if your brain can sense that there's like oh a little more pliability than there was, I, I think that can also kind of absolutely tune down the signals. Mm-hmm. That again, pain is yeah. there as information. Yeah. I have a video on YouTube. My my channel Institute for Birth Healing has a YouTube video on how to massage your C section scar. Perfect. So you guys can check that out. But um, you know, a lot of moms don't like touching their scar. And to me, that could be a sign of trauma. Mm-hmm. Uh, if if the birth was traumatic in any way, that that experience was traumatic, that the trauma keeps us from wanting to engage with the tissue. And so let's talk about that for a moment, because I have to say, full disclosure, like when I when I was working with um, a pelvic PT friend of mine, just on a lecture we were going to be giving, this was like a number of years ago. And she was like, yeah, the trauma of the birth. And she kept saying that. And I was like, but birth is not like that. I don't like using that word. It's like inserting this idea. and, and, And yet now I realize that it is a freaking mechanical. Yeah, it is, of course, a trauma to the body. I mean, it's not. So yeah. it's like an interesting um, kind of concept that, yes, this is like we're giving birth and it's amazing. And at the same time, it's really, really hard on our body. Can, so can you kind of give your definition of why you think it is yeah. a very appropriate word to use? Well, I wish we did have another word. To I know. It. Yeah. I think yeah. trauma in itself is traumatizing to hear. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Just yeah, that word. Exactly. Uh, but I want people to realize that we've done, there's in the research, there's MRI studies that show massive tissue disruption from birth that is not symptomatic. So there's, there's pubic bone injury 
that is asymptomatic. There is massive tears and, you know, muscle tears and ligament tears and stuff that are all showing up on a, a MRIs. And so it's, it's helping to highlight the, the, the amount of tissue stretch and, and damage done to the body. Okay. So we need to understand that first. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing we need to understand is that birth is a very physiological process. Our bodies are meant to birth. It's, it's meant to happen yet. What we're not addressing in our culture and our birth culture is the assessment of the body prior to birth. We're keeping moms healthy. We're keeping babies healthy, but we're not assessing to see if the birth door can open. To me, the birth door is the pelvis and the pelvic floor muscles. Nobody's assessing that. I had a woman come to me and she had a cesarean birth and she wanted to be back. And, and, um, when I went to assess her, her tailbone was sticking straight up at a 90 degree angle from the outlet. Ouch. It was a roadblock. She had a 48 hour labor that ended in a cesarean. And I'm like, why the heck did nobody know to even check? her bone was in the way. Okay. So, mm -hmm. so that's my, sorry, little soapbox. I wanted to just like help us to understand, like, what are we really dealing with here in our birth culture here? And, and so we're not assessing the body prior to birth like that. I wish that's my other soapbox that I want to, you know, like, come on people, let's be looking at the pelvis and pelvic floor muscles. I trained midwives to assess and to learn how to release the pelvic floor muscles. And they tell me that when a birth stalls and they release the pelvic floor muscles, the baby comes right on out. Uh. So the, per the pelvic floor muscles are so critical to allow the birth or not. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but when it comes to trauma, Laura, the there, I like to look at as, as lowercase T trauma and capital mm -hmm. T trauma, because those people that have, you know, know that their birth was traumatic, that's capital T trauma, mm -hmm. but there's small T trauma too. And that's that when a person is in labor and there's like, I don't want to do this anymore. Don't make me do this. You know, like, please make this stop that, that could be a trauma response in the body. Mm -hmm. And, and so that trauma response, like I said, is, you know, we can't fight it. We can't flight from it. And so all we can do is, is go into a freeze, a, a protective freeze response to try to, some of us even disassociate from what's actually going on. And, um, and we just need to know that our body, when we have been traumatized, it's like, if you think of your life as a timeline, and when these traumatic events happen to us, it puts a little blip on that timeline and a part of us gets stuck there, mm. but the rest of us continues on. And what happens is that that little blip where we got stuck there, our body gets frozen in that moment in time. And so if we're working and then we, we continue on and, you know, the baby comes out, but our body from that little blip in time, when we have that trauma response, our body doesn't realize it. Our body's mm. stuck in that moment. Our tissues are still responding in that moment. And so there's a lot of women that I've worked with that it's like their uterus doesn't know that the baby's out. Their body doesn't know that the baby actually came out and that it's over. Mm. So but what, what do you, of them. I was going to say, how do you, um, how do you guide people through that? Um, it's, it's really about helping their body to become aware that it's over. Mm -hmm. it, like, um, to, to, we need to help our clients to feel resourced, you know? So sometimes I'll, we'll go back to a moment in time where everything felt good mm -hmm. when everything was going well to help them to tap into that part of themselves when they were okay. Mm -hmm. And then to see them where they're at today. So we kind of like bypass the blip a little bit. Okay. Sometimes we need to go back to the blip that, to that moment in time and just see what, what needed to happen. What did... Did you need to say something? Did you need to do something? And I can't tell you the number of women who've come on my table and said, I just knew if I could get in hands and knees, then the baby would come out, but they wouldn't let me, mm. yeah. you know? So it's, it's that disempowering of, of knowing what needs to happen in your body, but yet not being able to allow or make that happen. Yeah. That's a trauma response. That's, you know, that's, that's, it, there needs to be another word, but that's, that's, it's, it's, it's a disempowering moment. 
mm-hmm. where we can't do what we know what we need to do to make things happen. And, yeah. And so, you know, and sometimes it's just tapping in, like tuning in, reconnecting to your uterus and thanking your uterus for the job that it did and helping it to realize that, that the baby is out, that the labor is over. Mm. And so I teach a, a trauma release statement that is super helpful and that we tune in to wherever we're tuning in, whether it's the pelvis or the uterus specifically, or just the pelvis in general, but we just ask these tissues to release any shock or trauma from the birth or from whatever event, knowing that the baby's, o- the baby's out and labor's over. And as we're saying that as practitioners, we need to really see if it lands with the body. Does the, does the body, does it land when I say the baby's out? Does it mm-hmm. land when I say the labor's over? And if either of those are not landing, we need to just maybe repeat it a few times or figure out. Sometimes for me, when I'm working with a trauma response in the body, a lot of times there's a limiting belief that gets implanted during that moment. And and if it's a really scary birth, sometimes that belief is that my baby died or I died, mm. you know, and yet we're still alive, but yet our subconscious thought that we didn't make it Mm. and so that subconscious belief is just kind of running in the background and that's why moms can't they can't settle they can't they they keep thinking that something's wrong with their baby or something's going to happen to the baby so they're in hyper vigilance and Mm. so there's you know so there's all this response and and i just encourage anyone listening into this that you know if you have experienced that that birth to just Really give yourself grace, give yourself the understanding that your body did exactly what it needed to do to get you through that moment, whatever that traumatic experience was. So whether it froze or whether you collapsed, whatever it was, it was perfect in that moment for your body to help you to survive. So we need to honor that that trauma response in the body. We need to acknowledge it and thank it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then we can help it to realize that we're beyond it. I love that. It's like, exactly. You you did that for me and it I no longer need it. And so right. thank you. Yeah. And that's what we need to help people to realize is like, that was, an, that was an experience back then. And we don't need that response today, that we're safe and we're okay today. And that's why the pelvic floor muscles, Laura, are like sponges in our body. They, they, they absorb all the emotion and they hold that emotion. And so it is so common when I'm doing intravaginal work to allow that tears just flow Mm. because as we're working with those pelvic floor muscles, we're releasing all that emotion. And there's a lot of stuck emotion from a birth because a lot of times the birth's too, too, um, it's too intense. It's too intense to be able to acknowledge and to deal with all the emotion and then unfortunately in our society today, it's, you know, we don't honor the experience of the mom. Oh, that was a beautiful birth. Oh, you've got your baby. Your baby's healthy. You should be happy. Yeah. No, it yeah. was traumatic as hell. Yeah. And we need to honor that for the moms. And there's and a lot of judgment. You know, there's a lot of judgment. Like, oh, did you have your baby naturally? It's like, you what know. does that mean? You know, like that's, you're setting that up to be a, like, that's an, in, <laughs> nobody's going to win here right. because, um, you know, it, it's, there's a lot of judgment and yes. sometimes moms or other moms are sometimes the worst. And I think that, I think what you're saying is a, let's, let's really acknowledge that this, you know, while some might get out of it seemingly, you know, like scar free, yeah. it, it that yeah. the, the, everybody is going through a big shift physiologically in the body and it, and many have been left with some kind of emotional and maybe physical scarring that needs to be addressed and we need to like really show mm-hmm. up for each other and and like you said advocate advocate for that um pr- the pre-birth um you know looking are you is the is the uterus ready um is yeah. the cervix ready is the birth canal ready um and then afterwards as everything kind of become um more or reorganized reorganize the the room not leave it so messy right <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah yeah well i love everything that you're doing and i can feel your passion um 
where can people find out all about these wonderful courses? If they can't work with you in person, how else can they, you know, yeah, uh, learn? So- um, so I, for, for practitioners, I have the Institute for birth healing.com is so Institute for birth healing.com is my platform, educational platform, um, for anybody who physical therapists or anyone with a license to touch can take my, my holistic, uh, treatment of the postpartum body, holistic treatment of the pregnant body courses. I have a intravaginal course for those that have the license to do intravaginal work. Um, I'm shortly going to be coming out with a postpartum pelvis that is just all about the pelvic patterns and how to treat those. Cause I'm, again, I just want people to know how to close up those bones. That's going to be coming out in a couple of months. Um, and, uh, probably in the fall of 2023. And then, um, I, so those, that's the educational platform and you can find us on all the social medias as well. And then if you are interested in doing a session, I have the center for birth healing.com. I'm located in the Denver and Boulder, Colorado area, but I can also do Skype sessions or uh, zoom sessions with people. If we're working oh. with birth trauma, um, we can, I can walk you through processing and, and dealing with the trauma in your body. Um, and so you can set up a zoom session um, on the center for birth healing.com. And then I also have a directory on the Institute for birth healing of practitioners who I have trained. So the people who have taken my pregnancy and postpartum course, they know and understand these concepts that I was talking about today. And if someone's taken my advanced course, then they know how to do the trauma work that it, uh, we were talking about with the birth. And so I have a directory, it's directory.instituteforbirthhealing.com. You can also find it on my website as well, but that's a list of all the practitioners that have, have taken my courses. So um, amazing you can get in person support uh, there. Amazing. Thank you so much, Lynn. This has um, been such an inspiring talk and I'm just um, a huge advocate for women. And I think this is like one of the best ways to be an advocate is for the mamas who, um, yes. you know, again, the focus is often on the baby. Of course it should be, but Thanks. then the moms have been left out, unfortunately, and they are the ones that have really uh, soldiered all the, you know, okay. all the big work. And so let's be their cheerleaders and their helpers. So well, thank think you for about that. Yeah, thank you. But think about the the world we can create if we can support moms more and get them feeling better in their bodies, right? They're going to be better moms. We're going to have, raise better kids. And and so the ripple effect of supporting moms after birth is huge. And and again, that's why I'm just so passionate about this. This works. It works well. We mm. just need to understand it and look for it and know how to treat it. And mm. that's what we I need love to it. Amen. Amen. Well, thank, thank you so much, Len, for your time and your wisdom and your passion. Thank you for this opportunity, Laura. So appreciate sharing this information with you today. And thank you everybody for listening in. Yes. Thank you, everybody. Make sure you go check out Lynn and all of her gifts. And as always, I'm pulling for you.